Uh, so yeah, this is Pulp Mythos. I'm Brian here with uh, Spencer and Larry. And if uh, you enjoy anything we're discussing, please hit that subscribe button. We're going to be dropping a bo the boys uh, premiere review uh, in the next day. And we do Lovecraft Country on Sundays. And we got a lot of other stuff coming up. So this show, I was trying to figure out a way to summarize it in the simplest way, like what it's about. And I, I came to a... <laughs> got an idea and it has to do with an old animated series so i compared lovecraft country to um what was it i don't even remember now uh gravity falls <laughs> this i compared to beast wars <laughs> so, 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 so you have two factions you have in beast wars the decepticons and the autobots they hate each other they're they're duking it out on cybertron there's this big war they're destroying their world they end up both crashing on another planet and basically continuing their war on another planet. So that's the that's the best way to summarize this plot. There's a lot to this show, and that's the simplest way to put it. But I mean, Transformers uh, is also a, a theological allegory. So uh, yeah. yeah, there you go. So yeah, th this show. Wait you have a second. What is the comic with the do with the horns and? They have a baby, and they're too, like... Ah, what the fuck is the name of it? Comic? Is that what yeah, said? it's a comic with the TV-faced people. Oh, Saga. Yes. It's like that. <laughs> it's like Saga? Uh, yeah, I see. I can see some... There's some elements of Saga in this. There's a lot, you know, one of the cool things about this show is that... I mean, I could point out things that remind me of Dune. Obviously, Alien. It's Ridley Scott. Um, a lot of different science fiction properties, and yet it still manages to do it somewhat in an original way to where I don't know where it's going, and I and I like that. That's one of the things I like about it. Yeah, we talked about that earlier, where it's there's a lot of elements from other stuff. However, the way it's kind of you know put together, we don't know exactly where they're going, what's going to happen. Uh, we made like eight different predictions, then talked to Larry on the phone and made like six other predictions. Like it's, <laughs> the fact true. that it's, there's that much to kind of go through and, you know, three out of the 10 episodes, it's crazy. The amount of content that they're able to raise questions with, uh, even with familiar kind of premises, it's still very original. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces, and a, a number of them are interchangeable. You know, like we talked about on the phone, like the question of is their prophecy real or relevant to the story at all? Who does it refer to if it refers to anyone? Uh, is there even a good guy in this series? Mm. You know, is there anyone to that you root for? I mean, I guess like you were saying earlier, Brian, arguably the children. Yeah, but uh, nah, fuck other. <laughs> <laughs> They're the worst I, of all. <laughs> I would say if I had any negatives to say, I, I first of all, I'm loving this show. I, and when I say love, I mean like this could be a top 10 of all time for me. Like it's on that level so far. Obviously, it could go downhill. There's seven it episodes. It could go a left. lost route. It really could. But as of now, I'm absolutely completely invested in loving it. But with that said, this is really, really sort of hard sci fi stuff. And I think. One issue they may have, and I don't know yet, I haven't dug into reviews, but Game of Thrones, well, I'm using Game of Thrones as an example. Game of Thrones is something that appealed to fantasy fans, but it also had a broader appeal. It appealed to people that didn't care about fantasy. I don't think this show will appeal to non-sci-fi fans. I don't know. Um, I, don't, that's, I don't know. Now, what, yeah, what do y'all think about that? I, I was thinking earlier, like, at right after we were talking on my way home, Brian, because my phone automatically connected Bluetooth and it started playing uh, Raised by Wolves because I was watching one of the episodes on my lunch break again. Uh, but they, uh, like, the 100, to me, is, it's CW. It's very, you know, yeah, it's CW. So, like, there's a lot of the teenage love bullshit that goes on. However... A lot of this felt kind of like that, you know, with, you know, the crashing spaceship and like there's a lot of things that we have brought up about maybe other civilizations being there. And there's a lot of questions that we had that were similar to the hundred. 
but the hundred went several seasons and it was very popular. Now this is geared more towards an adult audience as opposed to a young adult and teen audience, uh, which will, you know, bring in some different people. But I think depending on how they do it, uh, whether or not they get political and I don't mean political, like, you know, Democrats, Republicans, I mean, you know, so-and-so fight, you know, fighting for power or someone stabbing in the back for this, uh, which is what I think made Game of Thrones so successful was it wasn't just the fantasy part of it. It was literally everyone backstabbing everybody, killing, you know, their neighbor to get, you know, the next tier up. And I think if this show goes somewhat in that direction, they'll have the same success as far as that goes. And we, we've got a lot of hints that it will probably go in that direction. You know, I was gonna I was gonna agree with Brian until you brought up the one hundred because I do see a lot of similarities there as well. And uh that was a, a show that I think picked up broader appeal as it went on. In fact I've uh as recently as I'd say February had someone mention to me well come up to me at work and go, Hey, have you uh, have you seen the show The One Hundred? It's it's pretty good, you know, and you know, so I I think it does appeal to a broad audience. I don't think it'll catch on right away, but as it goes on, it'll probably start to pick up steam. I guess it depends on how, how quickly, you know, word of mouth gets around, but it may pick up faster than it would have under different circumstances. If we weren't all stuck in our houses still. (laughs) Um, I hope it does. I still stand by my original thoughts. Um, The hundred, the 100 was a teen drama wrapped in a science fiction cloak um oh yeah i don't disagree yeah, I'm this just is not <laughs> that at all your lead is a 12 year old kid uh, or one of your leads and two androids um i don't know M- maybe it will I-, I think also it's on hbo max and that's a big i know they were they weren't doing that great as far as subscriptions early on um even though anyone who has hbo has access to it they, they were still people were being slow to uh to sign up so, I, I think the the Viking guy <laughs> could be the the thing that pulls in people, maybe because he does have a fan base, and that might be something. But even I know people who are huge fans of that show who didn't even know about this show. Oh, so he's on he's on Vikings. Oh, and, and he, and I've asked the a star of Vikings. That's Ragnar. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, Ragnar. Uh, he's Marcus. like a main Viking. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I've only ever seen one episode of Vikings, so I didn't even recognize him. But I think the best way to get people over to HBO Max would be to, and I hate it because I, well, the last season of Game of Thrones was bullshit, but doing a spinoff series of that, you would get a bunch of people to come back. You would get a bunch of people who canceled subscriptions to come back uh, or make the the Soprano movie that they're doing with the uh, Gandolfini yeah. skit. Make that yeah. a HBO Max exclusive movie. I think there's a lot of ways to pick up a lot of numbers as far as subscriptions go, but I think that would also help shows like this. So, say you know it, the numbers aren't great, but six months from now, when one of those things that I mentioned happen, doesn't mean that specifically, but you know any of those kind of things. Now all of a sudden, you have a bunch of people who are like, "What the fuck is this show?" And then I think some of those shows will pick up some pace at that point in time too. So as long as they don't get canceled, you know, right away, they give them a chance. I think that it's well within the scope that they will continue on. Well, the good thing is we'll get a full season regardless of yeah. how it performs. But, <laughs> that that I'm happy about. And I and I hope I I hope it does catch on. I hope I hope there's a word of mouth and that people really push it um but I don't well, know. I, I feel it needed to be a, a lead in for a more popular show. Like Spencer was saying, if they had something that, that aired a, yes. right after it or right before that might've helped out because, and, and I'm only pessimistic in my tone because I looked up the reviews and there's not a lot of them even, you know? And, and so I'm like, I don't know if anybody's really watching it, but, but, but to be fair, uh, Perry Mason was like that too. In its in its first couple weeks, and then all of a sudden it took off, like week three. So maybe maybe this will do something similar, where people will discover it over the next couple weeks, and then be like, oh, you know, let me check it out. Um, so the leads before you, know, you say that October 
is a scary movie month and you got things like alien and people may start looking up Ridley Scott bullshit. So that may help it too. I was just thinking about that. This is a, it's a hard review to do just because there's so much information. We, there's three episodes, so it's not like we can, you know, like with Lovecraft country, we, we've got a very set formula, you know, late, you know, 48, 49 minute, structure and and you know it's pretty easy to review but there there's so many ca- things to review so i'm basically going to just bring up the characters and then we'll go, we'll dive into that and you know you guys just <laughs> anything i miss which i probably will miss a lot go for it so i'm going to start with i think the two mvps of this series so far with the first three episodes mother and father uh, brilliant performances i will say as of this second my favorite character is father Yes. I think I think the performance is absolutely amazing. I mean, I the, some of the most heartwarming stuff has been him. The in epi- and we're going to be jumping around the episodes. So, in episode 3 when he is pleading with um Campion about I need a purpose. You you're taking my purpose away, therefore I have no reason to exist. I mean, you. I felt that shit. Like that. That was one of the strongest moments in the entire three episodes, where I was like, "Oh shit," you know. Like you could see the worry on his face almost. Right. And so I'm loving the character. I love the relationship with him and Campion, even him and Mother, um, which is a very interesting relationship. He's the most logical one, as far as if I had to pick a character that I, I would say, you know what, that's that's the good guy. <laughs> It's father. That, yeah, that's this, that's the guy who's reasoning his way through everything and trying yeah, to find really. a solution that works for everyone. No, no even, one else in the series is doing that. Even to the point where he was going to give Campion to the humans that were the opposition, because he's like, "Well, shit, all the kids are dead. Um, clearly, we're going to break down soon. You'll be alone." So it, logically, it makes sense to give you to them. We've instilled this knowledge with you. Hopefully, you can take that with you and do something with it completely logical every everything he's done um yeah my fa- my favorite character so far i think Speaks. too when you talk about you know adaptation uh, and that's a theme kind of throughout the series so far with you know different characters evolving and doing different things but when you look at you know the first part of the episode when they land and he's you know making this joke that's re- when they talk about dad jokes, every joke he makes is very <laughs> almost like they're they're very pun ridden, but a lot of them are almost like riddles. They're, you know, limericks and stuff. So they take thought sometimes to, to understand them, which is even greater because he delivers them so dry. And it's but, I, I didn't even think about that. They program father to make dad jokes. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so good. Been, yeah, he brought that up to me. I was like, yeah, that's that's true. But you you have him in the first episode where he's not i mean he has a purpose but he's very one note he's just doing one thing and then by like you said Brian by episode 3 he has feelings for uh you know Campion and what does that mean does that mean that he's evolving does that mean that his programming was to always evolve or was that part of him like you know ai they always say if you know i robot where it goes from we're in control to where they're in control because they their programming will help them evolve now does that mean that you know father is evolving to a point where he is you know smarter than his own programming because like you said he's trying to save campion even though it goes 1000 percent against what he was programmed to do which was you know raise this atheistic society and he was like, nope, I just want him to survive. And, you know, I want you to give me a purpose, Campion. You give me a purpose. Without you, I have no purpose. And that was heartfelt because he he legit felt it. So that, to me, is really crazy and adds a whole lot more theories <laughs> for him to be able to evolve like that. Yeah, you have to question whether or not he's alive if he's in episode three having an existential crisis. Yes. You know, and I, and I do want some backstory on him because, unlike Mother, he doesn't seem as uh, hardcore about that part of their mission. He just seems to primarily be concerned with their survival and the fam- <clears throat> excuse me, and the family unit getting along and 
if they can't get along, you know, and if things don't work out, them surviving, you know, he seems to just be trying to trying to keep the family together at one point, yeah. regardless of the goal. And at other points, he seems to be more concerned with their overall survival than the religious aspect of it or what he was programmed to do specifically. He seems to genuinely care. And uh, like I said, that just makes me want to see, we, we've seen a few character backstory with uh, quite a few characters here, but we haven't seen father's backstory. Is that, is that common with his model? Are they made to be adaptable? Or is this something new he's evolving? There's seven episodes left. I I'm almost positive we're gonna get something. I I think uh, so. Well, let, fuck it. Let's jump into that. So when mother gives uh, birth, we'll just use that terminology to to the six children. Uh, Campion initially dies or isn't you know not breathing, and she takes him and he she homes and he um, comes he starts breathing. And so then they know because he's, I guess, the runt, he has to get the name Campion. They basically, Campion was the one who programmed them, the one who sent them on this mission. And they were told that, you know, this particular, if the, I guess the runt of the litter needs to be named uh, Campion, which is interesting to me. And I, I want and my assumption is we're going to get an episode that explains that shit. It's going to explain how they were programmed, how they were sent on this mission, specifically Mother, how the hell they took this nightmare weapon and and turned <laughs> it into it to uh, you know have children. What is in, what's special about Campion, etc.? I think well, all that's going to be explained. I hope it's explained. Yeah, I'm very curious about that because Father seemed genuine to, to be genuine, genuinely speaking when he said that. He seemed to. It seemed like he was being honest when I went with him when he said he was special. And I was like, hold on a second. I just, until then, I kind of did think he was the runt and he was lucking out on some things, you know, but yeah, there may uh, be something genuinely special about Campion. Well, I don't let's know. Let's go and I know, <laughs> let's jump into there real We'll jump into that in a sec. When we do, so the, the kids all, all right. die, okay? And we discover it's because of radiation. There, there's a lot of radiation in the area. Obviously, it doesn't affect the droids. Kills all the kids. The new kids that come later, which we'll get into in a minute, they get sick. The only person, human, quote-unquote, supposed human being, that apparently is immune to radiation is Campion. Why? Uh, I have a theory. <laughs> 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 Like you said, he was, when he was born, he wasn't breathing. He wasn't, like, he was struggling. Now, and I'm not tying this into Star Wars because it's not Star Wars, but when you look at, like, the Force, when they were trading the Force that, you know, Kylo Ren helped, you know, save Rey and, like, all that sh um, What if a mother or father put some kind of android something in Campion to basically make him survive, whether it was intentional or not, you know, when you look at, and it's kind of, it's cool, but it's gross at the same time. When mother takes out her eyeballs and the little tentacles come back out and they pull them back in and like all that weird shit. If they did something like that to Campion so that now he's like a hybrid where he's part Android and part human. Um, because, you know, you talk about runs of the litter, he's not aging. He's like aging very slowly, uh, as opposed to some of the other kids who died off really quick. So I think that it would lead me to believe that he is some kind of hybrid, like a yeah. half and half. Yeah, he may be something something new. You're saying like a human android hybrid. Yeah. Like po yeah, and that's a that's a theory. And I didn't know what I where I was going with it myself, but I think you kind of elaborated with it. Cause I was starting to think, yeah, he wasn't breathing at first and father said he needed to be broken down for nutrients and et cetera. Fed. But yeah, yeah. That's mother seemed least. to know something more and she was just like, wait for it. You know, but it makes you think like, was he, did he actually start breathing or did he start, uh, sort of simulating breathing in a sense? Like, was he, was, does he actually, does he actually breathe? Is he immune to the radiation? Because, like Spencer said, he's an android. I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of mysteries at this point. It's hard to say, but you know, he can't. It would be odd for him to just be human. 
Well, yeah, because not only did all of his brothers and sisters and die when they uh, when she stole all those other kids, they were all perishing as well. They didn't die yet, but they were all headed that direction. And right. me, and, me and Brian had to talk about another theory too, which I won't go into yet. But like, it's who's to say that there's not how many kids have passed before right. Campion persevered. Uh, the two other uh, leads. So the you the the first two parents you have mother and father, and then the other parents you have Marcus and Sue, and they're part of the. And we get a really cool flashback in you know the first was a second episode, that whole intro where we, yeah, we basically get a glimpse episode. of the war, which was cool. We actually got to see, you know, you you tell us about this grand war, and you actually show it to us. So that was neat. Um, so basically you have the two factions, you have this religious order, uh, which is very powerful and has all these insane weapons and they're killing the shit out of everyone. And then you have this other order, this, and this atheist order, and they're trying to, you know, fend off the religious order and they're, you know, have children soldiers and, you know, they're this all kind of shit going on with these two factions and, um, uh, Marcus and Sue, that's not their real names. They're actually two of, uh, from the atheist side. They get uh, they discover a droid that can change their faces to look like two people that are going to get on this arc, and you know the the religious side basically are going to wipe Earth out and then send an arc. I think they call it the Ark of Heaven yep. to uh, to a new world in which they'll dub New Eden. And so we get a we get a cool, we get a, basically we're getting the history uh, or getting a glimpse of what this war is, what these factions are about. And then we're to see it through the eyes of these two characters. And so Marcus and Sue, they kill, you know, their counterparts and they take their identity. Turns out they have a son, Paul. And then we get um, some of that family dynamic because the ship, the Ark, has a simulation, which is basically the Matrix. You uh, <laughs> Not only are you frozen uh, for the 13-year journey, but your consciousness is uploaded into some kind of simulation. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, and everybody yeah. can just sort of hang out there and live live life. And I think the performances are fine. Um, that side of things is getting more and more interesting the more we learn about them. And it is just not only are we dealing with the opposing side, but turns out they're actually um, in disguise. They're not really part of that order. So that, that's an interesting little twist. Well, like their son, uh, when they first encounter him, he's already suspicious even before they get on the ark. And then, you know, as they spend time with them and as they get to know him, uh, there's a line that he says that leads me to believe a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but he just says, you know, we were told that people may act, you know, different in, in the, the simulation. Place. And that sparked a whole bunch of thoughts with me. But, you know, he's starting to realize that those parents are way different. So he's kind of picking up on some weird stuff. But then he, you know, kind of just not laughs it off, but he explains it off to himself, you know, because of something somebody else told him. Well, yeah, I was going to bring that up, too. And it seems like it's in part because his original parents, from the way he describes them, just seem like they were that neglectful that he seems to feel that no matter what the situation is now, it's clearly better than what, what was happening before because he was surprised that they were talking to him. And yes. That, My, you know, and that, right. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I was just saying, you know, that, uh, that, that kind of puts that into context that, you know, he's, uh, his original parents were just that crappy that, yeah, something's off. Yeah, he may have suspicions that, wait a minute, maybe this isn't them, but who they are are people that are better than his original parents. So he's just willing to roll with it. Well, well go ahead. I, oh, I was going to say, I had a theory about how long they've been in stasis or whatever based off of that line in itself. Um, only because how long can you be in this simulation? So if it's 13 years, 
I think their way of explaining people will be a little different is because after a while, I think being in a basically VR type situation, like, I don't know that my personality would change. I'd basically be the same. However, after, you know, 13 years of waking up every day and knowing things aren't real, like it would start to fuck with your head a little bit. Like, you don't know what's real, if you're really out of stasis yet, whether you're really, you know, awake or whether it's still the simulator. Like, it's... That's Larry's current current situation. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he doesn't know whether or not he's really alive and that me and Brian are real or if he's dreaming this shit. Yeah, thanks to COVID. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Um, I think... So, we know that there was... That uh, Marcus the real Marcus, the one that was killed is part of the warrior class. And we also know that, um, he's a captain and that their warriors are hardcore (laughs) as far as the way, just the way they are as far as their religion. And we, there's a scene where he brings the mouse for a pet and immediately Paul thinks he has to kill the mouse as a test to prove he's not weak, which tells us that that's the kind of shit that, that's forced on them on the kids of these warrior guys and but but then again uh, then again they're so his parent the original parents were so shitty do we know that because that may have just been how crappy his original father was that he'd do things like that because he found it odd that his father would even talk to him and and during the scene where he's playing with his son and he runs into Seemingly, someone of higher rank within their religious order. I think you know, he apologized. Yeah, a cler- yeah, it was a cleric. That's right. And he he apologizes, and she says, "Oh no, no, I'm I'm glad to see, you know, a warrior, just uh, just uh, leaving the war behind, and we're going to need peace on the new world." And and you know, just the fact that they were very chill about it, and they and that they didn't find it off says that that may be their culture, or it may be that these parents were just that bad. Yeah. Well, remember too, um, when you learn about Caleb, uh, you know, that he was part of the whole, not the child army that the, the atheist had to me, yeah. that shows that both sides really aren't all that different. If he's, you know, having his son kill mice to harden him up, that's not a whole lot different than what Caleb was introduced to as a child. Like it's all like both sides of these warring factions are both shitty people. They well, both- yeah, and that that seems to be a big theme within the series too. That you know both sides are are, are kind of crap on this world, but in different ways, and in a, a lot of ways they're the same. Because you know, one thing we we mentioned earlier as well was uh, these. This wasn't your stereotypical. Okay, this this is the hardened atheist faction, and they're all about technology. And and here are, here's the religious faction, and they shun it completely. You know, in fact, the religious the faction, <laughs> yeah, the opposite seems to be true. And all our preconceived notions about what's going on seem to seem to be flipped. Because I originally thought when we saw the necromancers, which is the name of the model android that mother is, I thought they were genociding the religious order at first until we, well, when they showed the initial scenes, I was like, okay, these are the atheist robots and they're, they're after the religious folk, but then we, but then we see it from, like you said, Caleb's perspective, and we and we see it's the other way around, and that just kind of flipped things for me. But like you said, on the on the other side of that coin, the atheists have child soldiers. You know, the atheists are are teaching them to hate their enemies uh, without without any thought of well, both sides are so hardcore into thinking that their their enemies are less than human. That uh, you know they 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 just they it's impossible for them to see eye to eye in this conflict in which they seemingly have very little differences outside of the religion <laughs> itself is all I'm saying. I and also uh, even though taking the two factions out of the equation, Caleb the character is a much different man. He he did come up in that child army, but he still has compassion where 
the original Marcus seemed just based on what we know seemed like it's just a piece of shit. He did, um, yeah. <laughs> because you can say Caleb and say, well, there, there's a couple scenes that show this. Just the relationship he's he seems to want this family. Like he seems to enjoy the idea of having a son. He also um, Sue makes a reference that she can't have kids, but they don't go into it. Right. So there are a couple that can't have kids for what I don't know if this has to do with uh, who knows maybe they'll go into it later. Yeah, but it seemed all... like it was it was uh, vague enough that it could have been a part of their, you know, their their role in the military or the fact yes. that the, the war is going on, or it could have been a biological thing. But you know, it's well, it, it it seems like like you said that he very much wanted this family and that they were in a situation where they they thought that they could they could never have this. There's a scene where one of the androids is uh, humming or singing uh, f- for the other android that was killed in battle. And Caleb is, or Marcus, we'll call him, we can call him either or, but uh, he's disturbed by the song. And at first you're like, well, why is he freaking out? And then they basically state, well, this song is saying when we're doing mass executions to the atheists. So he's probably heard it before. And he's probably seen people die. And seen this song sang and praise. So he has a lot of trauma. He's going through a lot of shit. And we see that, you know, he likes the idea of this family. And the only thing he he doesn't even care about is life. When you get to uh, even in the third episode, the only thing he's thinking about is getting Paul back. Like, you know, so right. so specifically him as a character, uh sh- is showing a lot of, you know, compassion and love. Well, I, well it's one of those things he's oh you got uh, I, I was going to say that he uh, showing him kill the parents at first. I was like, wasn't thinking that he is compassionate about the family or nothing. He's just looking out for number one. He's been through some shit. But then, you know, you find out he really wants the kid. He wants the family. But then I started thinking about how big of a piece of shit the real Marcus was. Because I think that they were just scared. Like they were hiding. The war's going on, and they're fucking hiding out. Like, they're not going to the Ark. They're not doing nothing. They were hiding. And then they got found and killed. So, what what was going on that they let their kid be away from them in a war? That would be like any of us, you know, having our kids and just being like, oh, well, I'm just going to send you to this boarding school, even though it's there's a grand possibility that it's going to get nuked by... A foreign country next week like you wouldn't do that like if you care about your family you would keep them as close as humanly possible during shitty times like that so for them to just be like oh well whatever shows to me how big of a piece of shit the real marcus and sue were yeah and and to and to the uh caleb or marcus as he's now called and (laughs) and the the new sue they've spent years raising this kid in the simulation. So to them, they're very much a family. This is a very real yeah. thing to them at that point. The, yeah, absolutely. Uh, clearly, you know, the more you dig into the story, yeah, it's, there's this war, there's religion, atheism, there's androids and, you know, monster aliens, which we'll get to in a minute, but clearly, uh, and this is the best kind of, this is what I love about science fiction at this is a story about parent parenting. <laughs> it really, you know what I mean? Yeah. All this shit going on, but at the root of the story, it's about parenting. I mean, really think about it. Think of all the major characters. The two leads are mother and father. Um, it's it's about parenting, and and we'll see where you know where that goes as the story progresses. So, the coolest sequence so far of the three episodes, in my opinion, we'll see if you guys agree, is is mother attacking. Uh, the Ark of Heaven. Oh, that was oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's if you've ever seen the anime Elf and Lied, it's <laughs> sort of uh, close to plagiarism, uh, I would say. Uh, that scene um, when she's walking going through the hallway, but it's still really cool in live action. Well, and my first thought was, "Holy crap, she's just one of those." I, we saw I we saw uh, a ton of them back on their home world, but she's just one, and she did all that. How do you even it, stop I mean, that? it's it's super graphic. And and so far, so far, they haven't shown that they can. Like, none of their weapons are effective on her. There was nothing that they could do about it. That's why when they keep talking about, oh, we should go fight her, I'm like, and do what? 
you've <laughs> proven that you can't do anything. Now, now they did introduce a kryptonite, if you will. They introduced the idea that her power it does connect with the eyes, and she wears them in a bag around her neck now. So, so I guess in theory, if you destroy the eyes, she she loses her power. Well, well, that's so, a self-imposed kryptonite on her part because I mean, how would you on on any other model, you know, or any other necromancer? How would you you do that? Yeah. Their world is uninhabitable at this point. There's no going back. You need to hire Colin Farrell and let him like throw, you know, bullseye some, (laughs) (laughs) some like ink pens or something into eyeballs. Well, you know, there's a line about the eyes, um, the fact that you know the eyes are, are what powers them, and then there's a line about souls and do androids have souls? They don't have souls. Uh, you know the whole saying. You know, eyes are you know the window, the window to, the soul. to the soul. So I, I th- I'm guessing that that's all Metaphor. part of that. Yeah. Well, here's here's my question. That brings up uh, another mystery that I forgot about. The, the um, Hardy Boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the um, whatever their head priest name is uh, on the religious faction God. side. The I main... can't remember his title. I don't yeah. remember his name, but they kept calling him Your Eminence. Yeah. Yeah, then, there we go. That's it. <laughs> like, but his other android, the one that sacrificed herself for them, mother took one of her eyes. Why did she do that? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I know. What she, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I found that scene odd. I don't, I don't really see an explanation I, for it. W- when she took the eyes of the, the other guy to the uh, other droid, my, my get this is just a complete guess. Clearly the eyes for some weird ass reason, uh, has a major part of their programming or how they operate, maybe, and s- maybe by taking that eye, she'll gain some knowledge or gain some abilities. I don't know. Like, well, I was I'm, thinking maybe you think of, I don't know, like D and D and those kind of things where it's you're able to see what they either saw. Uh, There's an episode of Black Mirror. Remember the where they had those like contacts or implants or whatever, and it recorded everything they saw. What if those well, eyes are a similar kind of thing, and she well, can start picking those things apart? That, that's what I, that's what I thought at first, but then she jumped in. But then the other android, she uh, jumped into that steam hole, and uh, you know, kind of destroyed herself. So it'd be useful to that point. There's got to be another reason. I think. Well, maybe it's the programming thing. Yeah, I, yeah. Somehow, for some weird ass reason, the eyes. Um, because the way they were making it out, if if her um, necromancer were destroyed, she could no longer t- uh, tap into those abilities, uh, which is weird as hell. <laughs> A weird ass design, but okay, that's that's the way it works. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, especially because it's a, it seems to be like a sound weapon. Sound doesn't come from your eyeballs, so like that made less sense to me how that was, like you said, their kryptonite. It, it'd be different if it was like, if you rip out her throat, you'll be fine. Like, it's... Ripping out the eyes didn't make sense to me. Unless it basically becomes like Cyclops, where she can't control it. Like, if she uses it, like, it basically just kills everything, including herself. Like, I don't know. Maybe her eyes are how she's able to direct it. Because remember, when the, the pregnant girl fell down, she was able to, like, knock those, like, creature things off of her from like she had very good uh, aim yes <laughs> yeah but that's what i'm saying it might yeah. be maybe that's what the eye thing does because i Tempest, can't think of... i believe was her name yeah yeah that was her name and i i also noticed she shouted at her not to look at her and i i might be wrong but i think she did that once before when she took the uh necromancer well, marcus form. Marcus told all that when when she first attacked, he yelled, "Don't look at her!" Remember, he kept covering his eyes. Yeah. So there's some kind of thing with the eyes. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe the know. eye contact and like the screeching eye contact, like all the things together, is what. I mean, I'm sure, regardless of how they explain it, it's still going to be weird because it's bullshit. It's science fiction, <laughs> so like it doesn't really matter yeah. how they say it works. It's that's not a viable thing at this point in time, but I would like an explanation regardless, no matter how bullshit it is, I would still like one just to kind of they're gonna piecing it together. They're going to leave it as vague as we just said. There's going to, you know, you're going to have your uh, 
behind the scenes and Ridley Scott's just going to explain. You see, the eyes are the window of the soul. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> the... and, uh, so Sandra Bullock, you, they're going to bird box everybody. They're just going to run around with fucking blindfolds on and <laughs> try and fight her blindfolded. <laughs> yeah. I, I. So let's see here. Uh, well, let's talk about Be- the new kids. Um, well, so Before you talk about the new kids, the eyelid ripping off part after she blew everybody. Ah, good like, God. Yeah, that, was gra- <laughs> that was graphic. That was graphic. <laughs> yeah. She just straight rips dude's eyelid off to, to oh. get, oh, and they show it. I mean, they're, they're very, <laughs> very um, graphic. I didn't want to it. jump past the ship part without talking about that. So go ahead now. <laughs> that, no, that is a great, that is a great that, moment. That was an intense scene. <laughs> So she collects five. Ch- she lost five children. She collects five, brings them back down uh, to raise. Basically, one. I mean, Hunter is, is not a child. He's fucking basically an adult. That was the only thing that I was laughing about. They bring one guy. I'm like, this dude's pretty he's much like grown. This is grown man. <laughs> but okay, he's a kid. So they he, they yeah, bring he this. Just, he just basically went along. He's like, I, I work. In this daycare center, but okay, I'll pretend to be a child <laughs> if it'll save my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was funny. So he, yeah, he comes down, and, and they they all have their own personalities and different, you know, ideas on the religion. And he seems to be more in in tune with the with the order. So you're saying different kids have different personalities? <laughs> yeah. Well, well and it, well, it's it, that's sort of the thing that's weird. Well, not weird, but that's sort of the thing that the show I think is trying to point out is. It doesn't matter what you teach a child. Um, at some, most of them will, will find their own path. Right. You know. You 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 know what I mean. Like the in, and it's interesting that the adults haven't figured that out. You have these two factions that are indoctrinating these kids. You will believe this, and then the kids are just like, ah, screw that. I'm well, yeah, this other sort thing. of thing where yeah, you can you can you can teach them concepts and ideas but you can't expect them to completely remain remain you know in step with you on those ideas they're going to deviate to some degree yeah you know and uh but both factions seem to be very strict about their rules like if there were any atheist amongst the uh i can't remember the name of the religious order but i can't can't especially the name (laughs) my they also refer to themselves as like children of soul. Soul. That well, that's part of it. It um. Yeah. I yeah so if any of them bit. deviated and decided they were atheists, they'd probably kill them there on spot. Yeah. The you know, so. I'm saying both factions, you know, are no holds bar about their particular beliefs. We we learned that uh, Tempest, uh, who's the older girl in the group, uh, during the simulate or when they were in the vr or whatever you want to call it that some of the higher clerics well, at least one that they know but probably more uh, one that got caught i should say uh had found a way to basically unthaw themselves and they were basically raping young girls during that 13 years and one of them was caught and i guess he was going to be executed uh the next day before um mother destroyed everybody so she's pregnant we find out that she is pregnant and mother is excited. She wants to protect the child. You know, now, now, you know, she it, everything that she wants to happen is sort of happening quickly now. You have a, you already have one of the kids that's pregnant, and that's I guess part of the plan. I'm very curious to where the hell that story is going. Well, yeah, because, she wants future generations of of humans. You know, yeah. so mother's very excited about that, and not considering how, like you said, Tempest actually feels about it. Exactly. So I'm, yeah, I don't know where that's going, but we shall see. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was an interesting little, little twist in the story. Um, so we, we, let's go into the prophecy real quick. There's a prophecy that what an orphan child will lead them to their new city or some shit. It's the Mithraic. It's like M I T H R A I C. I had to look it up because I kept wanting to say Mithriol, but that's like Lord of the Rings. So, <laughs> but that's what it was. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So they believe so, that an orphan boy will uh, be their their prophesized chosen one. 
Yes. And I was curious, you know, there's two science fiction properties that have dealt with prophecy, dealt with prophecy to science. Yes. Science fiction properties that have dealt with prophecy in a scientific way that wasn't, you know, like supernatural. And that would be Dune in which basically you had a group seed the universe, the galaxy, the universe, and basically say, Hey, there's this prophecy about this Messiah that's coming one day. And then they basically orchestrated the, uh, the Messiah to come. So when he showed up, everybody was like, Oh shit, that's the prophecy I heard about, you know, for the last 300 years. And then Babylon five, there was a time travel angle where there's this religious order that's very hardcore about their religion, but somebody from the future travels back in time with all this knowledge and they're back in time. Yeah. So those are two different ways that could be done. Will this show do either of those? None of those. Does the prophecy even matter at all? Or we don't know, but um, you guys had, you both had theories on the prophecy. Uh, Larry, you had a really good one that I didn't think of. If you want to talk about that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause the obvious one is, and you know, they kind of point you in that direction early on is that it could be uh campion. But I think the inobvious one is that it could be uh, what's our what's our main uh, Marcus or Caleb. Marcus? Yeah, we'll just go Marcus. Yeah, Caleb, because Same Caleb isn't was orphaned oh, yes, on their yes. previous planet, so he's an orphan as well, and he's the one butting heads with the leader of the uh, the Mithras cult right now. So there's a good chance that if this if this uh, prophecy is relevant, it'll be Caleb. Well, yeah. It, I mean, he seems because, to be truly concerned about their people, where whereas their leader doesn't. He's clearly looking out for himself. He clearly views them all as disposable. You know, so I, I say if it's going to be anybody, there's a good chance it could be Caleb. Well, you look at two. Um, sorry, I gave the dog ice cube. They, uh, McGruff loves fucking ice cubes. It's so weird. But you have, um, you have these. Two kids, one of them, what's his name, Paul? Caleb's kid? Yeah, Paul, yes. Paul, yeah, they're a kid now. Uh, so he's an orphan. He doesn't know he's an orphan. Um, but as of right now, Campion's not really an orphan yet. Because father's still there, mother's still there. Although he was created, and his parents, I don't know how that really works, but he hasn't been orphaned yet. So I don't know. Depend depend on the definition of orphan. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's it's very hard to define who it is. But at this point, I would not be surprised that father becomes the <clears throat> end all, be all kind of prophetic person. Um, when you look at religion, a lot of times it's you know father, son, the Holy Ghost. So when he's referred to as father, I don't necessarily think that it's just, he's not just going to be father as in dad, like father as in this new order of like a new religion, because he's going to be coming. Like he, like maybe a father so, of a unified humanity. Yes, because he's so logical. He's evolving at every point in every turn. And that could also be because remember, she took out the heart, liver, kidney bean, whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> and <laughs> put, that's a good description. That's what I look like. Yeah. <laughs> but she put that in him and it changed him a little bit. So then he evolved even more. So I think that his evolution as he keeps evolving, I'm thinking that it's probably going to be father. And that's, mm. that's my thought is who is this going to be? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I I know. I don't. So the opening of the first episode, I think they do it again later. I, I believe it's Campion telling the story. Um, mm. but I never trust those that could always be a uh, trying to throw you off. Uh, <laughs> it's well, how I did, met your mother. <laughs> well, they did. Like, well, how mom met dad. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's an exact. There, there are many it's examples. Like, and that's of, how I became the chosen of, one. <laughs> <laughs> There's many examples of um, movies that have used that that uh, storytelling technique as it, but it they threw you off. Um, Casino is a great example. 
where Pesci is, you know, narrating the story a lot of it, and then he gets killed, and then the narration changes. <laughs> so, uh, the, so yeah. Um, so there's a lot of mysteries also. We're, we're about <laughs> to finish this up. There's a million mysteries. I'm going to rattle them off, all of them, and then we can just go for it. Well, well, I was just thinking also how great it would be if, you know, Campion gets killed later on, and we we uh, switched to the narration of Elder What's-His-Name, the leader of the religious faction. <laughs> I hate that guy. Uh-oh. It's just this shitty, scheming, I, Weasley guy who's trying to sacrifice everyone for himself. I didn't hate him hate him until he made them carry him on a chair. And then I hated him. I was like, come on. That, that was him trying to check Caleb. Exactly. But it's... Uh, I, would, I mean, I don't know how their order works and there's only a handful of them left. If Caleb just straight shot him in the face, I don't know would anybody, I mean, what I would think that's do? only a matter of time. <laughs> it might be. I hope so. Yeah, though, There will be a point where they're alone or, or at some point, I, I guess Caleb will demand a tribe trial by combat. If that's a thing in their culture, who <laughs> it might be. Um, so we're introduced to these creatures, these xenomorph monster things, uh, which I forget because Ridley Scott, you gotta, you gotta have the, that, um, but the mystery is they've supposedly been on this planet for 12 years, maybe longer, but who knows, but they're saying 12 years and they've never seen them before. And, and Campion points out, he's like, what the, he doesn't believe they're real because he's like, I've been here my whole life and I've never seen, seen this shit. Where did they come from? Why are they there now? That's where did you go? Where did you come from? Mystery, Guy, my Joe? mystery you two, be? uh, you have these giant holes all over the planet what the hell are they for? And they have grooves in them, and I don't know. Yeah, they have these grooves, and they've always got like this this hot mist coming out of them for yeah. some reason. <laughs> what's, what's that about? Just steam yeah. and dirt. <laughs> uh, as I said earlier, Campion seems to be immune to radiation. I mean, you know, what's that? You know, why? Um, and then the third episode ends with Paul getting lost in the woods, and he discovers what appears to be a toy which would have had to be man-made. And he appears to think he sees another person uh, in like a cloak. Now this could be, you know, in his imagination, it could be a hallucination. But I don't, maybe not. Are there other people there? Well, the toy was very similar to the one that uh, Mother made for one of the first generation of children. I, I don't remember any of their names besides Campion because, well, they died so fast. Oh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, it looked similar to that. And the person he was chasing after was singing as, as well. And it, the song sounded very similar. So you know, that makes you think that it's it's got to be one of those kids or possibly a previous generation of kids. Well, remember the one kid that was walking towards the big giant wormhole thing yeah they never showed what happened with her they just assumed that she fell down there and died and she was carrying a stick doll that was just like that one so who's to say that that wasn't her stick doll lost out in the middle of the woods or whatever comes in or out of that wormhole steam (laughs) thing didn't you know grab her or you know anything so or here, here's here's a thought that just hit me why would if they had time for to, to send out more pods why would mother and father be the only mother and father that they sent to this world or, or sent out into space you know what if there's a a second group out there who's being raised by a second set of androids i mean their programming would be the same so They'd, they'd probably make similar toys. They'd probably have similar songs. Well, I was talking with Brian, too. Uh, remember, they said that there was more of those basically like embryos or whatever on the ship, but the ship you know, crashed and got lost. Right. What happened to those embryos? If there is you know, monsters or creatures or whatever down at the bottom of that hill or at the bottom of those holes... Who's to say that they didn't use those embryos and create some other new kind of fucking hybrid, whether it's some monster human baby? It's well, yeah, because the the original count was like twelve embryos, right? And we twelve, 
We only we only see six kids. They only had six. Yeah, and, and, they, then, and they never really specify what happened to the other six, whether they lost them or whether they tried to burn them and it didn't work. And I also find it bizarre that she brought back only five kids, therefore having the, the six. Because if her programming was 12, why didn't she bring more kids back? She only she only brought back the enough to fill in the five that had died. So I thought that was a little interesting. Well, and we talked about that too, that it perhaps is this isn't the first generation. This is try number two or try yeah. number three. And, you know, if it's multiple tries down the line, how many of those tries is Campion been a part of? Uh, and I was also noticing if you look at the drawing, the draw, the drawings, the <laughs> drawings and the, and the little igloo things. Some of them are much higher up, which to me would indicate that some of the kids got older as they were drawing on the walls or drawing whatever. But all the ones they kept showing that died were not very old. So was it another generation that made it to a much older age and then left? Was it a generation that made it, you know, to be teenagers before they died? There's I like that there's not a lot of answers yet, but I have a lot of questions. Yeah, there are a ton of questions, and we we still don't have definitive answers on well nearly anything we've talked about so far. <laughs> no, uh, no, we we were three episodes in, and and no, we 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 don't, and uh, we know there's seven left, which which is a lot. So a lot a lot can happen. We could uh, be completely like this- wrong about everything. The uh, like, in fact, the the order of Mithras. Maybe they maybe they didn't send out the necromancers. Maybe they just know more about them. For all I know, you know, maybe because because we saw them attack the the atheist and we saw them abandon the world. But you know, as you were mentioning, why would they leave those behind? That's a, that's an incredibly powerful android to leave behind. I know I know they thought they were going to find peace on their new world, but as corrupt as their leader seems to be, I think he would keep one of those. <laughs> uh, that now that you say that, that may explain why she stole that one's eyes. Maybe that was another necromancer. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, Definitely. If that was a necromancer, why didn't it turn on? I mean, she whooped her ass pretty. Well, pretty if the original easily. ones are as loyal to the the order as they seem, it may be it may be part of their scriptures too that they're going to find peace on this new world and that they're supposed to leave those kind of things behind. You know, so. He may have yeah, like ordered deactivated or he, yeah, he may have part de- of their code, <laughs> right? You know, he may have done that. He may have simply ordered it to conceal itself and stay concealed as long as, you know, any other members of the order are watching. Like, cause they, they seem to obey him without question. There was another, um, I believe his name was Lucius. He was introduced in like Malfoy one scene. <laughs> But he, you know, he comes to introduce himself to Marcus, basically, you know, I guess to be his friend. And he, but he mentions his father. And he's like, my father served with you. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I remember him in the battle of whatever. And which, of course, he didn't because he was not Marcus. And but he says something interesting. He's like, oh, you forgive him. And he's like, yeah. well, you know, he's like, well, of course I do. You know, we're, you know, that's what we're all about, right? And. <laughs> Dude but what the hell did he need to forgive him for? You know, that was one that's, of my that's what I was thinking too. He accidentally forgave his father for something very heinous. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. well, like, well, yes, well, like, what is this? Like, like I'm pretty Marcus sure it's, it's a giant piece of shit. So if the real Marcus was a giant piece of shit and this other guy was a bigger piece of shit to a big piece of shit, what Marcus, did he do? <laughs> yeah. well, well, yeah, you know, and it, it's the sort of thing like uh, the guy's father could have been that guy who was about to be executed for all we know. The one that uh, that that we that uh, was on the ship that uh, God, I can't mother, oh, yeah, that yeah, mother yeah. destroyed, yeah, it could have been him, and so yeah, so Caleb could have forgiven him for some very heinous things and not even known that, you know, it's it's hard to say, but they clearly left that a a mystery for for a reason, <laughs> you know, it's uh, 
it, it's not just going to be like, oh, yeah, you forgive him for, you know, like for disagreeing with you that one time or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, well, even or, or, just... or stilling the good VR pod. Yeah. <laughs> even Caleb was just the one with all the hot yeah. Um, he's like, yeah, I, I forgive you. <laughs> so yeah, um, <laughs> Cooper disagree. Yeah, that's um, I think that's about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, he was scared. <laughs> we're gonna be. Doing these reviews, uh, the plan is for them to go up on Thursdays. Uh, the next, hopefully, they'll be more focused going forward. <laughs> this one, as I said, I it, three episodes, trying to uh, deal with three episodes that each had their own structure and their own story, and you know, trying to cover all this. Um, it's difficult, but. Yeah, and also, like I said, the boys' review is going up tomorrow, and it'll probably be as messy yeah, there as will, this review. <laughs> there will not be additional structure in the boys' review. Yeah, that's right, exactly. <laughs> I was like, um, <clears throat> trying to take notes for this thing. I was like, how the hell? Yeah, but the boys, there's not as many mysteries kind of floating around. There's a couple, but not like 47 like this one. That, that's true. It's pretty, <laughs> it's, it's pretty straightforward. So... All right. Yeah. Um, anything else before we go? Uh, no. uh, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say, I, I hope if this isn't a, a self-contained show, do, you, do we know or not whether it's self-contained in this one season? I don't think we know. Well, if it's not, I, I do hope it gets renewed. So hopefully it, uh, it picks up. Cause like you said, yeah. I, I mean, I'm enjoying this as much as I'm enjoying the boys. Me and Brian talked about that earlier about it being picked up for multiple seasons because it's there's a lot of ways that they could do it um if by the end of this season they kind of close out this story you could go kind of like spartacus did where they did a preview season and then like a post season on both ends of the first season they could go back and explain the war explain uh how the necromancers were made why they were made uh, and then kind of the ramifications of what happened after they created the arc, why they did this. Uh, you know, it, there's a lot of things that they could do to expand on this lore, which I think would be really cool. So hopefully it's successful and we get to see more of it. Yeah, there's hoping. So yeah, every Thursday, uh, look for. So, all right, this overly long review. I'm going to close it out. <laughs> <laughs> I tell anybody's listen to this. Part. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. They get out of the 30 minute mark, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, shit. Three. <laughs> they, they, look, they looked at the length of this video, went, it's over an hour. I'm like, now nah, I'll watch that later and just never probably. clicked on it again. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, but I, I, you know, I wasn't, I think we talked about that too. I, this first weekend, just because the reviews had already been out, I wasn't sweating it. Um, I was like, look, they, you could have watched a review for this show fucking two weeks ago. So, um, thank you for joining us. Goodbye. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Bye. Later. Bye. So there's a big debate online about how to release um, streaming series. The Boys dropped, uh, Raised by Wolves, which we'll we'll be talking about uh, in this video, uh, dropped. And The Boys is getting review bombed because, simply because, not because it's bad quality. The people actually are reviewing it or saying they're enjoying it. It's the fact that they dropped three episodes and then they're deciding to release one episode a week. Uh, afterwards everyone wants everything dumped at once and i'm bringing that up with this because uh raised by wolves is doing the exact same thing dropping the first three episodes and then one episode a week um first of all it irritates me that it's being that anything's being review bombed for that reason but what do you guys after watching these three episodes uh what do you think as far as how a show like this should be released specifically uh, raised by wolves uh, spencer well, I think that 
this show might have benefited uh, from being all dropped at once just because there seems, and we'll talk about it too, uh, like the continuity as far as, you know, timelines and what's going on. And there, there's a lot of gray area as far as, you know, and we'll discuss that part, but I think that this could have benefited from that. However, HBO Max is a new streaming service. Uh, and we talked about it too, the content. So if you're running a YouTube channel, Facebook, Instagram, anything, if you posted something once a week, people are only going to come to your thing on a Thursday or whatever. If you constantly have something coming on, so, you know, Lovecraft Country is on Sundays. Now you have, you know, this on Thursdays. They're going to have a couple more streaming shows that are going to start. So now you've got people coming back consistently. It offers more, you know, substance to your service, which is what I think they're trying to do. So I have zero issue with them dropping one a week uh, because, I mean, I'm keeping the service anyway, and I really love the show. So I I have zero issue with it. Well, I got to agree with that because, you know, they've ran the numbers and with series like Stranger Things that you, where you get it all at once, you talk about it for maybe that week and then never again for the rest of the year until you get a maybe a trailer for the next season or something you know they didn't find uh, a lot of companies didn't find it to be as uh, marketable you don't you don't sell as much merchandise you don't get as much buzz around the show it's harder to keep the show going when people are only talking about it for for one week so i mean i guess it could potentially be better for you know shows like the boys and raised by wolves both of which i'm enjoying right now and would like to keep going will like to see these shows continue like, but if people stop talking about it after this week, when season two comes, maybe no one's hyped. Maybe, uh, maybe they're not able to push it as easy because they've seen the same issue with a number of shows. But I, I don't know. From another perspective, I'd, I'm also greedy, and I'd like to see it all dropped at once. And <laughs> you know, like Spencer was saying, a show like Raised by Wolves, uh, where it's more of a slow burn, may have benefited from at least having the first season drop that way. You know, just so you get an idea of what the show is all at once. Unless it's a self-contained thing. I, I feel it may have been better to drop the entire season all at once. Raised by Wolves is definitely very bingy, just the the way it's structured and each episode ending in a way that makes you want to, you know, watch the next one. But I completely understand why they're doing it this way. As you, as you said, Spencer, about Stranger Things, looks Raised by Wolves... It, you, first, you're getting three hours. You're, almost, you're getting almost three hours of content on the on the drop. And then an hour a week, this is going to run almost all, all the way through October. So people are essentially going to be talking about this show for the next couple months. And that's the goal. That That's what they're trying to accomplish. So I completely understand it. And as far as the review bombing for the boys for this reason, the, the people who are doing it are hurting the show. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're killing the rating and now here's a show that you you know you as a fan love it, but because they didn't, you know, give it all to you at once you're, you're gonna you know try and hurt the score i don't see the point in it but whatever i do uh i i don't agree with it but people now use social media to get what they want so if they're mad about whole foods not selling their favorite chips they boycott you know you know on social media or even taco bell most recently <laughs> Like they said, oh, they yeah. stop serving the Mexican pizza and everybody blew it up on Twitter and everything else. So they use it as a platform to kind of get what they want as far as those kind of things go. So if they figure if they raise enough stink about it, then they're already all eight episodes are done. So it's not like a network show where they film, you know, a couple episodes a week and then, you know, they really don't have next week's done yet. They have all eight episodes. So if they figure if they throw a big enough fit they'll just drop them which i got i hope they don't because <laughs> i don't i don't think they'll cave in i good. really don't i i just i don't they said you know i don't it's, think they will it's kind of a foolish tactic though because let's say it works let's say a review bomb actually works okay it gets less ratings what typically happens then is that a, you know they don't go okay we change our mind a show gets canceled then because they see <laughs> yes they're, they're going to take it as people not having interest or people not liking the show yeah, there's a there's a really good article over on uh, lrmonline.com uh, by Joseph Jammer, and um, 
he goes into that actually and 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 the the possibility of this could hurt the show and it could get canceled so yeah yeah definitely go check that out if you're listening to this but one of the reasons that we're we're talking about this and we haven't jumped in the review the review yet is because uh, there's been reviews for this show for weeks so we're assuming that if you're listening to this now you're late to the party or you're you know maybe a fan of us which is cool thank you and I wanted to talk about that, too, before we jump into the review. They gave re- review copies, the first six episodes of this, to a lot of publications. And they gave the boys, they, I forget, like the first three or so episodes, weeks and weeks ago. So there were, there were reviews for this that have been up for weeks. Now, I understand they're trying to get the word out about the show. So I completely, completely understand that. But for, you know, for the smaller guy like us who are, you know, trying to build our brand and you know get get the get something out there you know this sort of kills us because <laughs> we're just we're not going to get a lot of clicks for the first week yeah hbo start hooking us up too shit. <laughs> we watch all of your but, stuff like all the things 